Oh, okay. Sí, dame. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Commonwealth Coordination Meeting this afternoon. I was going to give another two minutes, but I think we should make a start. Now, as we all know, cybersecurity is one of the global challenge. This global challenge needs everybody's efforts to make sure that our citizens and our people benefit from ICT development and also are aware of the dangers that come with it. So we have among us Honorable Pinky Kekana, Deputy Minister of ICT from South Africa. And uh, may I call upon you, Honorable Minister, to open this session, thank you. Thank you very much, Acting Secretary General of the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization, May Gisa Fuatai Purcell, but also let me take this opportunity to acknowledge all the participants, including our uh, panelists who are here. It gives us great pleasure on behalf of South Africa to be uh, open in this session under a very important theme. And Madam Acting Secretary General, inclusive or multi-stakeholder approaches to policy making are not new. They have been tested and applied in a range of policy uh, spaces, including climate change, ex extractive industries, conflict pre prevention, and peace building, amongst others. In the internet governance space, the, inter the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, IANA, 
transition, which in 2016 saw the U.S. government transfer its clerical and stewardship roles in the domain name system to the multi-stakeholder community was seen as proof that multi-stakeholder approaches can address difficult and challenging policy issues and produce credible and working solutions. One area, Chair, where such approaches have obvious value is in the development of national cybersecurity strategies, the NCSS, which are now widely seen as critical to a nation's economic and social well-being. So to us, the cybersecurity challenges that a nation faces are broad and interrelated. And this, in turn, necessitates an approach that leverages a broad set of expertise and engages a diverse set of stakeholders in the NCSS development process. And these high-level commitments are reflected in a number of NCSS explored in this report. For example, the Ghanaian government cybersecurity strategy, which states that there is a need to address fully all aspects of cybersecurity, especially the multi-stakeholder approach to fighting the cyber menace. The Mexican government's uh, cybersecurity strategy states that success of the strategy will depend on stakeholders' collaboration, and that Mexico's national cybersecurity strategy is a, li is a live document that will set the roadmap for the development of cybersecurity in Mexico with an integral transversal and holistic approach and with the collaboration of different stakeholders. However, examples of in implementing the approach remain scarce and practical guidance are lacking. So throughout the CMM, there is a mention of role of stakeholders and multi-stakeholder engagement across the model models maturity levels, although importance of stakeholders' engagement is highlighted in all three documents, none offer any structured guidance to help design an NCSS development process in a multi-stakeholder way. So we take this engagement today and this gathering to really become, come with clear programs and approaches that will assist towards the practical implementation of multi-stakeholder guidelines in as far as the issue of cybersecurity is concerned. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Se Acting Secretary General. Thank you, Honorable. It's a pleasure to have you here today. And I thank you very much for availing your precious time to come and open this uh, Commonwealth Coordination Meeting. Okay, so um, I'm very happy that all our panelists are here with us today. Now, let me introduce uh, our panelists, um, our panel. Uh, Ms. Naya Bambalu on my uh, extreme uh, right. She's the Head of Public Policy and Initiatives, Center of Cybersecurity, C4C, from the World Economic Forum. And then um, on my left, right next to me, is Mr. Oflaf Gogman. He's the Chief Internet Technology Officer from the Internet Society and Commissioner of the Global Commission on the Stability of Cybersecurity. Kevin, um, third from, uh, from me, he is the uh, Head of Strategic Relations and Integration, Latin America and the Caribbean Network, Information Center, or LACNIC. Welcome. Then uh, Yulia, um, second from me. She is the Head of Strategic Relations and Integration, Atlantic, no, I'm sorry, uh, representative of TAG. Together Against Cybersecurity, which is a non 
non-profit um, civil society organization, and they are working to, um, against cybercrime. And then right next to me on my right is my colleague from the Commonwealth Secretariat, Mr. Matthew Moorhead. He's the acting head of the Office of Civil and Criminal Justice Reform of the Commonwealth Secretariat. Welcome. Okay, so um, as we all know, the internet today is growing and in, in an uh, incredible speed in ways that have enormously impacted the way we live, the way we work, and the way we do everything. So therefore, it is imperative for the international community uh, to come together and uh, broaden to discuss, strengthen communications, and broadening, uh, broadening consensus deepening cooperation and embrace extensive consultancy, uh, consultation. So this is a very important uh, topic, very close to our hearts. So first off, the way we will do it is I'll be going around our uh, panelists asking um, questions, give their perspective, and after that we will um, uh, give the floor um, to provide some questions and, um, and we go from there. So on item one, multi-stakeholder cooperation and cybersecurity and cyber resilience capacity development. So let me go to, um, to uh, Naya first. Um, if you would like to give us a brief of what uh, the World Economic Forum is working on, the challenges um, of multi-stakeholder approach and some of the um, the models that uh, you have worked with around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, and an honor to be here uh, with, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I would uh, maybe, I wouldn't want to spend much time talking about, you know, the forum per se, but really deep dive on, on the key issue here on the multi-stakeholder approaches, good practices, bad practices, and, you know, the the challenges. Uh, I would say the forum uh, in its own right is a multi-stakeholder platform. Uh, it, is, uh, it really brings leaders from uh, industry, government, international organizations, civil society and academia together. And uh, in, that, uh, in that context also the work on the, of the Center for Cybersecurity has uh, been um, uh, around uh, being, a, has been designed around being an impartial and policy operation leadership bridge. Uh, and in that context, uh, we're working on, on building communities or on setting agenda and thought leadership, on accelerating existing solutions that might be in a specific uh, geography or in a specific industry and how to, to, to take that forward uh, more globally and into what we call shaping architecture. So when we see there are existing gaps or, or um, opportunities for, for building better public-private cooperation. So uh, having that multi-stakeholder uh, public-private cooperation DNA, uh, the, one of the areas that uh, we are um, confronted with is uh, the skills gap, and that actually mm. uh, permeates uh, all three of our priorities, which is on strengthening global cooperation, on, on uh, securing future technologies, and in, in uh, also accelerating industry solutions. So in all three areas of our, what I would call broader communities that we have, the skills gap is, is quite striking, and uh, it is at all levels. Uh, therefore, what we find as capacity building, which most often is, is uh, in a taxonomy, used in a taxonomy of more about you know institutional building and government uh, capacity, we see that there is a similar skills gap in um, in uh, also in industry uh, in leadership. Uh, what we see is that we, we don't have uh, policymakers that they are um, prepared uh, for the challenges that cybersecurity is facing. So there is also a matter of. Uh, understanding the, the issues, um, having people that can serve, I would say, you know, we need, the, the policymakers don't need to be uh, technical experts, but they need to understand the, the 
policy implications of technological solutions that are being put forward. So in that context, uh, one of the, um, uh, the public-private cooperation we find is, is critical. Uh, one of the approaches that the, the World Economic Forum has uh, put forward is uh, looking into a national and local ecosystems how the public-private cooperation there, either when it's led by government or when it's led by industry, how there can be that can be a sustainable model for capacity building, where you, you bring either the industry finance or, you know, in terms of government-led or academia-led, uh, building those communities that they are not only tackling the, the skills gap, but they also can help in creating the local capabilities and not being brought in with expertise uh, mm -hmm. from abroad in a kind of ad hoc training and so on, but creating also the, the market incentives locally mm -hmm. uh, and, and the potentially even, you know, at the letter stage an innovation hub uh, once you have the local capability. So this is one of the areas that uh, we've started to work um, uh, some months ago by creating a community of uh, industry leaders and public sector leaders and it's more of a, I would say a framework that we want to, to share uh, and uh, design with uh, in a multi-stakeholder uh, way that could then be adapted uh, in different uh, contexts and geographies. It's, uh, I believe, given the challenge of um, uh, both funding, um, also cooperation across sectors, there's a lot of silos uh, amongst donors, uh, implementing agencies, uh, quite a, sometimes conflicting uh, motivations uh, yeah. uh, and, and the lack of matchmaking. There are some initiatives like the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise that actually are trying to help to that end. And I believe uh, the more we, we talk uh, both uh, in fora like this, uh, but uh, also talk to each other, and we recognize that alone we will not solve uh, this uh, kind of you know, big elephant of a, of a, of a challenge. Uh, sure. we, we want to uh, move forward. Um, and in that context, I think for, from our perspective, the. It, it's challenging to be a multi -stake, to have a multi stake forward approach, but it's 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 the only way. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much um, for your perspective, and um, um, thank you for the work that uh, you're doing um, with the uh, World Economic Forum. Um, two things I picked up is one capacity building, and the second one is motivation. I think uh, those are the uh, two aspects that is really required when we try and uh, uh, build a multi-stakeholder approach. And then, of course, it comes communication, collaboration, and uh, uh, connectivity. Okay, thank you very much for, for that. So still keeping on the uh, multi-stakeholder uh, organizations, but looking at the practical approach on cybersecurity strategy. So um, let me call on um, uh, ISOC, on Olaf. Um, I would love for you to give us a brief on the work that ISOC uh, has, uh, um, has done in the uh, African Union, and uh, especially in terms of the Malawa Convention. And then perhaps next steps, and. Um, to see whether there were any uh, concrete recommendations that um, was a result of uh, the Malawa Convention. Thank you. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, thank you for that very good leading question. And also thank you for having me here. Um, yeah, I, the, the Internet so uh, Society, our African Bureau, I'm talking, uh, 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 our African bu Bureau has been approached a couple of years ago by the African Union to um, help bring together um, the African community, the internet community, to create a second step in the implementation of the Malaba Convention. The Malaba Convention is the convention that is uh, setting cybersecurity and privacy guidelines for the African region. Um, but those are recommendations that are at the highest political strategical level. 
And as we all know, if it comes to cybersecurity, cybersecurity is always implemented on the floor. It's implemented uh, close to users. It is implemented in networks. It's implemented in uh, uh, by, by thousands of people, uh, by, by, uh, by big companies as well as SMEs. It's, it's one of these things that needs to live in the hearts and minds of the people who actually implement uh, uh, the measures that make our environment secure. And the only way that you can get to, uh, to that is uh, uh, through making things more concrete. And I think that this is one of the things that we try to do um, we took upon us um, uh, an implementation strategy, an implementation framework specifically for internet security. So cybersecurity is a broad subject. Uh, privacy was also part of the Malabo Convention, but we focused in this particular breakdown into uh, uh, working with the community, with the African community of C-certs, of ISPs, of uh, uh, local network operator groups to, to get to that next level. Um, in a number of consultative uh, rounds, we came to uh, we, we we finalized with a report that uh, gives a number of recommendations, going from a high level actions that can be taken by uh, uh, the, the at the regional level by the African Union to actions that can actually be taken by ISPs and operators. Um, to go down uh, from the regional level, um, uh, African-wide Cybersecurity Collaboration and Coordinated Center Committee, the ACS3C, um, because we love our acronyms, um, um, was one of the recommendations. And the goal of that committee would be a multi-stakeholder group that would advise the policymakers in the AUC on the regional strategy and the capacity building and, the f and, and facilitate information sharing across the region. Capacity building and information sharing are both topics that come back throughout this whole recommendation. Um, capacity because people need to do the work, they need to have the, the knowledge to do it, but also capacity sharing, um, and that means also information sharing. At the national level, there are uh, recommendations for identifying critical infrastructure and creating the protections around that for internet uh, infrastructure. We're talking about fibers, we're talking about uh, internet exchange points and, and, and CCTLDs, for instance. Uh, another recommendation there is to actually have information exchange at the, at the national level. So not only do the ex, uh, information exchange on the, on the high level, also try to do that at the national level, because that, again, that is where the work takes place. Part of that is establishing and strengthening uh, the security, uh, computer security and incident response teams. Those are the places where information exchanges happen between uh, the various sectors and the information that is out there by security companies and so on and so forth, and where concrete actions can be taken and where the trust is built in order to exchange that information. Because trust, it's cybersecurity in the end is human work. And then, uh, obviously, uh, uh, there are a bunch of other recommendations in the report, which I will not all read, uh, but we also had a number of what are the concrete recommendations for the ISPs, and in general, in organizations, when you connect to the internet, what should you do? Um, the, the name of the document is the Internet Infrastructure Security Guidelines for Africa. Um, that is how you can find it when you Google it and, and see for the recommendations. Now, recommendations can stay an empty letter. That is always the risk of a recommendation. Um, but I'm, I'm actually happy to, 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 to note that in uh, a week time from now, or two weeks time from now, the first meeting of this uh, African-wide cybersecurity Collaboration and Coordination Committee, again, there's the acronym, the ACS3C will meet. Um, it will announce its memberships. This is uh, the AU that has, uh, has uh, uh, the AUC who has uh, the African Union that has uh, organized this meeting. Um, I believe that the announcements about memberships are forthcoming. Um, but this is a, a first step that helps with the coordination of these, uh, these, these issues. Further, in national bodies and IDFs, of course, this work is being undertaken. Yeah. Thank you very much for um, 
um, that uh, perspective on the work that uh, ISOC has done in the, for the African Union. I, I would actually say that the African community has done for uh, Africa. Um, we have played a small facilitating role, but this was the community that did it. That is excellent because it doesn't matter what we do at the international level, when it comes to implementation, this is where we, the citizens of our countries, come in. This is where um, um, government um, look at um, enhancing the way we do things and the way we uh, collaborate. So in, that means that we need to look at everybody. We even look to look at um, civil society and we look at women's group, women committees, because I can tell you now that women are the best implementers of any public policy. Now, oh, yes. not because I'm a woman, but I've been there. <laughs> so at the CTO, um, we also do the, uh, the that's our role, um, kindly uh, funded by donors, including the UK government. But um, our role is we go out to countries that request assistance and help them develop um, cybersecurity strategies and policies. But we know very well when it comes to the implementation, we work very, very closely with the governments and there are some very good examples or success stories of that um, collaboration. But for me, deep down, my question is, I think my question here, I better say it out now, for, it's not just for the panel, but for everybody. How can we increase the awareness of our citizens on cybersecurity? Given the fact that coverage is not 100%, at least within the Commonwealth countries, um, developing countries, we at uh, organizational level and government level, we develop strategies and then we implement it. But what can we do to increase this awareness if somebody in the rural areas was given a mobile phone as a gift and then immediately he's learning and then there comes a text. If you pay 50 US dollars, you will, we will then send you 900 million. What's going to happen there? How is the awareness uh, can, how is awareness can be done? Because to me, it's very important. I'm from the rural village and that is why this one comes into mind and I thought it's best that I say it out now for the uh, sake of uh, everybody. Okay, so now thank you, Olive. I'd like to um, now move on to Kevin. Now, I know you're from LACNIC, and I want to ask, what are the uh, perennial challenges with LACNIC work, with your work on cybersecurity? And then maybe if you can touch on the uh, key elements of building a cohesive cybersecurity strategy and the role of a multi-stakeholder. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and again, thanks to the CTO for this opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I think in addressing these questions, I'll just give a general overview as to what we at LACNIC do in this field. Uh, we have been spearheading wider engagement with public safety actors um, for, in recent times, we have started ramping this up. And by public safety actors, we refer to um, law enforcement, police officers, public prosecutors, the judiciary. And our intention is to not only establish relationships with this grouping, but to also build trust. I think Olaf um, pointed to that, that it's really a human side element when it comes to cybersecurity and collaborative approaches. Build trust among the public safety actors, internet actors like ourselves that are not only, not just us who are responsible for critical resources, but other internet actors who are operators of all kinds, um, even operators of internet service platforms and social media, and last but not least, the InfoSec uh, community. And it's in this last grouping where LACNIC really got its foot in the door because we started with technical cooperation and CSIRT building um, because of the demands of our community. Our community noticed that there were a lot of LACNIC resources implicated in global cyber incidents 
and um, there was a need for us to strengthen our capacity to mitigate against these. So framed in another way, our work in cybersecurity is on two fronts. We support police investigations and prosecutions for cybercrime, and in this stead, um, thinking about um, crimes that are mediated via computer systems. And here, you will know that, um, you can note that all of the RIRs actually are working more cohesively on this front. Um, we have recently, recently established something called the Public Safety Coordination Group, where we exchange information on our engagements with law enforcement and how we go about building knowledge and capacity across the world. And in addition to that, um, on a technical front, um, you will find that we support investigations and responses to offense and crimes against computer systems. And here is where I talk about the LACNIC warp. Um, so I'll break down warp in a minute. The InfoSec professionals, um, some of them coming from Brazil, Mexico, and Argentina, um, began researching uh, cyber attacks in our region around 2011 or so. And they published Spanish language manuals to treat with incident response. And between the years 2014 and 2015, um, we noticed that there was a need to create a unit within LACNIC to provide an additional service to members in terms of proactive and reactive incident management. So in 2015, the LACNIC WARP was created, and the WARP stands for Warning, Advice, and Reporting Point. It consists of three services, a warning or bulleting system on rising cyber threats and the evolution of prominent incidents. And in general, this is an observatory function. Um, the second service would be advice brokering, when, uh, which is allows technicians to contact us with a view to helping them manage an ongoing incident and thereby reducing risks, reducing damage, preserving evidence, and making contact with other support actors. And third but not least, um, our anonymous reporting function, where through anonymous reports and confidential reports, um, we're able to use aggregate data to publish statistics on trends, uh, major cyber incident trends, such as the IP origin of incidents, types and numbers of incidents, and even breakdown on particular types of um, incidents, such as um, botnets affecting um, our resources. So these are our activities on a technical front, but of course they're not devoid of strategy because we also have, with this, a couple of other value-added activities. Since 2014 at the LACNIC events, we have a recurrent gathering of all of the CSIRTs across Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, it's a sub-event within the two annual LACNIC events that we have, and it's really a trusted space for the CSIRT professionals in Latin America and the Caribbean to share their experiences in identifying the ever-evolving nature and profile of cybersecurity and skill sets, because skill sets is one of the things where they realize we always have to keep revising um, continuously to keep up. And we also forged uh, strategic alliances with FIRST, which is a global grouping of, of certs, uh, MORG3, more acronyms forever. Uh, MORG3 refers to Mobile Messaging and Malware Anti-Abuse Working Group. Um, we have strategic alliances also with Team Cymru. And through these agreements, we have mini global symposia at the LACNIC event. So we have a mini first symposia at a reduced cost for LACNIC um, persons participating in a LACNIC event. We collaborate with the, the organization of RISE conferences with Team Cymru and other activities. And last but not least, we have an outreach and capacity building called Amparo. And through Amparo, we work with local communities and stakeholders to set up or to strengthen their CSIRT capacities. And of course, this will imply a basic assessment of each community's uh, cyber defense capacity. And of course, um, we ideally will work with communities that already have other elements of cyber strategy in place, um, meaning that they'll be working on um, policy and legislative um, imperatives, cooperation imperatives, public education imperatives, and we are here to render assistance on a technical front. So it's not just a linear activity. We have recognized over the years that there are a, there's a lot to be uncovered from local communities in understanding the scope and range of what cybersecurity is. And for us as uh, 
capacity building actors, well, actors that provide training, um, we do realize along with other actors, there's so many silos involved. So we have started actively trying to reduce these silos by collaborating with other actors working on other elements of strategy, um, in particular um, actors such as the ITU and the OAS that are very prominent in the Americas when it comes to help building out cybersecurity strategy and policy. And in the long run, um, what we are trying to do is to improve the trust um, trust among these communities, sensitization, collective knowledge building, and uh, this is because we recognize when we talk about cybersecurity and cyber attacks, these represent the new face of what is traditionally organized crime. So here is where bad actors, they're highly educated, they're highly skilled, and they're highly organized, and we as well realize the need that we have to be just as organized in order to build proper cyber defense. Um, so, the, so that leads on to the questions, the elements of, of, of good cyber uh, strategy is understanding um, that there are various components at play. It is an ongoing task, um, it's not static in the least, and of course um, that trust is a key element in ensuring that all of the parts actually come together and, and work um, to have effective cyber defense. I'll stick a pin there. And, come back to other questions later. Thank you very much. Um, it's very, very important um, that uh, we make sure that users of the internet has trust all the time, every time. So this is why we come together and think of ways that we can do that. Make sure the users of the internet has trust. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Um, it sounds to me that uh, we are all on the same level when it comes to multi-stakeholder approaches and um, to ensuring that um, we are looking after our people, and I'm talking about the six billion people in the world, and especially I'm focusing on the 2.4 people within the Commonwealth. I mean, it's huge when you think about it, 2.4 billion, that's a third of the world's population. So it's very, very important um, for us as Commonwealth um, countries to come together and uh, look at how we can collaborate and move this work forward. Okay, Yulia, I'm so happy that uh, we have among us a uh, representative from a nonprofit civil society organization. It uh, takes me back in the days of the preparations and planning for the uh, WISIS, the World Summit um, um, of the Information Society. At the time, I was representing my country, Samoa, and I was very, very vocal to make sure that in the declaration, we do not use the word developing countries. Well, we did, but we have to make it um, um, state that as the World Summit of the Information Society, we should focus and pay special attention to least developed countries, small island developing states, landlocked countries, and economies in transition. Well, I may have been from a small country, but yes, I was asked to give the language for paragraph 16. Now, one of the biggest issues then was civil society, they were given only seven minutes to, um, to provide this. When I say seven minutes, it's all the civil societies in the world, they were given seven minutes. Um, but today, my question for you, Yulia, is um, what do you see as the uh, critical role of civil society in cybersecurity? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, Gisela. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting, and as you said, the civil society uh, is important. So I feel myself being privileged to be here because first you mentioned the lack, you know, and the role of women and the empowerment. So I feel myself being empowered because uh, 20, uh, 12 years ago when I started and I 
you know, um, to be in the field of cybersecurity, cybercrime, I was like alone on the panel or doing these works. So I'm very happy you mentioned this as well. Thank you. And uh, the role of civil society. Indeed, we don't have a lot of civil society working on cybersecurity from you know, uh, um, uh, at the ground by doing things or we don't know them actually, this is the problem. So maybe a few words on what we do. Actually, um, as you just mentioned, I uh, do represent and I founded the civil society organization called TAC, Together Against Cybercrime International. We've been working a lot across Africa with the Malawi Convention, Cybercrime Convention, uh, Budapest Convention, I mean, and et cetera, and et cetera. So what we do, mainly three things today. Um, we do make assistance to victims of cybercrime. It's, it's a huge uh, topic, and you mentioned a lot the role of users, actually. How can we empower users? How we can be useful to them? And I think this is how we can be useful to them. Uh, the assistance is very important. Obviously, we can't bring the assistance to victims of cybercrime in all, uh, well, concerning all threats. So we work in a very particular, on a very particular cases. We do have actually, as well, the capacity building. We work a lot uh, with the specific tools we developed to raise and to empower um, the specifically the law enforcement on how to collect the evidence, how to detect the evidence, and how to bring the evidence to the court, because this is a very uh, critical issue as well, uh, in order to have the evidence be accepted by different courts, uh, if we take into account that the countries, they have already the legislation in, in place. And the third point, we work on awareness raising. It's also, you mentioned a few times, the importance of, 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 of having and how we can uh, raise the awareness of users on online safety, on the existence of of different mechanisms, so we try to work on this as well, specifically uh, by involving the young population and young people with our, our project called Youth IGF, which is present in 35 countries today, um, and our ambassadors who became actually young leaders, huh? I can mention a few of them actually, they are now, um, uh, have been involved as trainers, for example, by the African Union, if I take the ambassadors coming from the African region, on uh, by training other young people and even leaders on how to establish internet governance uh, community and how to be effective in the cybersecurity field as well. So with this project, we try to involve them in order to raise the awareness of other young people, other young uh, you know leaders as well as a different target group as well. So uh, this is about what we do. In order, um, I would like to bring uh, three main points from our point of view. Uh, that we think um, would be, you know, useful to be part of the cybersecurity strategies. I've read a lot of cybersecurity strategies as well as, you know, help to develop them as well. And in a number of cases, of course, the role of civil society could be the implementation of these, uh, of these different points that I would like to bring to the table today. Uh, first, um, I think there is a lack, and it was said already by the uh, World Economic Forum, it's a lack of uh, of skills, the skill gaps, but what I would like to call the, uh, what was said actually by the UN Secretary General yesterday at the opening uh, session, it's a, a lack of policy expertise on cybersecurity and specifically among the young leaders, uh, the new generation of the, of the, um, of the coming uh, leaders uh, in this field. I think there is a role of civil society in this as well. Uh, a second point, um, um, this point is quite often missing from the cybersecurity strategies, to be, to be very honest. It's the importance of reporting mechanism uh, for, uh, you know, of cybercrime cases, and this is very important for users. If they are aware and if this mechanism will exist, uh, then we will need to develop the work on the awareness to where the, our population and the users and the citizens about this reporting mechanism. So afterwards, we will be able to assist the victims. And this, I think, it's very important. And the third point, you mentioned already the awareness raising. And I think the awareness raising, when we speak about uh, how can we raise the awareness of, this, of our users, of our citizens, and especially in the uh, you know, like rural, rural areas, let's say, I think there are two points. It's awareness raising on online safety. So how can we stay safe online? Uh, what are the threats? But also the awareness raising, for example, on these uh, reporting mechanisms, because when we will raise the awareness on these reporting mechanisms, automatically we will raise the awareness on the online safety as well. 
And so this should be integrated into the uh, cybersecurity strategies quite often. It's not there yet, but I hope we will, uh, you know, it can be improved. And I think the civil society has a, a very concrete role in, in the implementation of these points as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Yulia. The, you raised some really uh, important points, which others have raised. So um, the key thing here is capacity building. I think that is one of the key um, element of developing, um, of whatever we are doing with cybersecurity, including raising awareness. So that's really important. And then you also brought up the fact um, about uh, the other part of your job is collecting evidence. And as soon as you say evidence, I'm thinking data. You know, when we, th when we talk about um, artificial intelligence, we talk, we're talking about data here. And I, I have this thinking that, okay, so while in artificial intelligence is great, it has to have data. Without data, we can't really um, depend on artificial intelligence, especially to do with um, um, uh, evidence in cybercrime and uh, all those uh, issues. So thank you very much um, for that. And then finally, to my uh, colleague from my, um, is it the parent company organization or the sister organization? I think sister. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Matthew, <laughs> in 2018, during the Commonwealth Heads of uh, Governments, or JOGUM, uh, the Cybercrime Declaration, as you know, was endorsed in the uh, Heads of Commonwealth uh, Governments um, communicate. So I just want you to, um, to tell us what has ComSec been focusing on in terms of implementing the, the, the declaration and also look at uh, perhaps the inter any international cooperation in cyber uh, security that you have looked at, especially in terms of investigation. Sorry, I've... I've I think I've got that. <laughs> <laughs> I've been preparing these questions and uh, it, we're all here to help each other, okay. shall we? <laughs> yes, thank you very much for having me to the Commonwealth Telecommunication Organisations. Um, I'm from the Commonwealth Secretariat, which, uh, as, as you said, is a sister organisation. We're partner organisations um, in the Commonwealth. And uh, this is one of the areas where I think we can work really closely together and do really good things. Um, the Commonwealth Secretariat has uh, uh, really only in the last 18 months become quite busy um, in the cybersecurity space. Uh, this forum, of course, is about multi-stakeholder approaches, which, which caused me to have a real think, because the Commonwealth Secretariat is an intergovernmental organization um, which works for and through its members, which are governments. So everything that we do is really focused at governments and assisting them. However, within that function, um, we've learnt to listen as widely as possible to other voices, of course, because uh, I think, as everyone in the room will realise, um, that's essential for any kind of development project to have, succeed or have any chance of success. So we are uh, trying to listen as much as we can. But if I uh, may, I'd love to introduce you to the specifics of the Cyber Commonwealth Cyber Declaration. <clears throat> It was uh, endorsed by all Commonwealth member countries, that's 53 countries, uh, at um, the meeting of heads of government in London in April 2018. Um, and we believe it's an important expression of uh, the desire of Commonwealth heads of government to maintain a free, open, inclusive and secure cyberspace. Uh, it sets out for the first time uh, quite significantly, a common vision for ensuring that the internet remains free, open and inclusive across the Commonwealth. So for many Commonwealth countries, this was the first time at an international level that they'd made a, a commitment of that nature. <coughs> it's a, the declaration is a call to action 
uh, by all Commonwealth countries, which seeks to build on the general commonality of official language in the Commonwealth and um, similarity of public institutions. I think most concretely, the Cyber Declaration is a commitment to collaborate and help each other to uh, address cyber infractions and cyber security threats more generally. Uh, it builds on the work both of the Commonwealth Secretariat, the CTO, and of course member countries uh, with a um, commitment to make cyberspace uh, a safer place. He wants, the Cyber Declaration intends to support economic and social development and rights online. Uh, it intends to build foundations for an effective national cybersecurity response and promote the stability in cyberspace. So the stability of cyberspace through international cooperation. Um, I was interested to hear the uh, minister from South Africa mention um, Ghana's cybersecurity program. That's um, one example that uh, we have looked at from the Commonwealth of, of, of a member country working in this space. And we've, we've learned a lot um, from Ghana through our conversations with them. Um, so the declaration uh, commits Commonwealth countries to work closely to evaluate and strengthen their cybersecurity frameworks. So where they have an existing framework, all Commonwealth countries agreed to review and upgrade them, and where they don't have one, uh, to get one pretty quickly. Uh, it commits Commonwealth countries to raise national levels of cybersecurity and to increase their cooperation to counter cyber criminals. Uh, there are um, specific commitments to tackle criminal groups and hostile state actors and uh, to prevent and respond to cybersecurity risks. The Commonwealth Cyber Declaration is supported by an implementation plan. Uh, which sets out a plan through a variety of programs to uh, achieve certain things. Uh, the Commonwealth Secretariat itself is running four broad programs under the banner of the Cyber Declaration. Uh, it's running a... Uh, the first of those programs is uh, Africa-focused. Um, so I'd love to talk to uh, my fellow panellists here about the work you're doing in Africa. An advantage of going last is I get to hear what all the other panellists are doing and uh, reflect on ways that we can cooperate. But our Africa activities are focused on um, the Gambia, Kenya and Namibia, uh, where we are conducting cyber capability assessments um, with those countries, uh, investigating um, their legislative and criminal justice um, capabilities um, and their general cyber resilience. Uh, and I, we're working with them to identify key areas uh, where they can um, make legislative changes or um, build capacity or indeed reach out to um, partners who might be able to offer assistance. The second program is Caribbean focused. Um, so uh, Kevin, it might we we, we, should, we might like to talk about this, <laughs> and we're in the in the Caribbean. We're aiming to build the capacity of judges, prosecutors, and investigators to uh, share and work with electronic evidence uh, to transmit it safely across borders and to uh, deal with it in courts. So we find, of course, that a lot of um, judges, prosecutors, and so on uh, lack familiarity with electronic evidence. And electronic evidence really seems to be coming up almost in every single criminal investigation um, uh, these days. So it's, it's quite important that they develop there. Thirdly, uh, we are running a program to strengthen international cooperation in cybercrime investigations generally. So we uh, have set up a Commonwealth-wide network of contact points, people based in um, uh, national prosecution agencies, uh, so they uh, can have direct contact with each other, uh, direct informal contact with people in other countries who they know, so that uh, electronic evidence can be swiftly, securely um, shared between countries. The, there are 
big barriers at the moment to moving electronic evidence across borders through formal channels that can be very cumbersome, slow moving, um, and that's exactly what you don't want to be when you are addressing uh, sophisticated um, cybercrime threats. So we're, we're working on building informal channels of communication and uh, prosecutors are reacting well to that. We think that's, that program is, is of particular potential. And finally, uh, the program which I am most involved in myself is uh, focusing on strengthening election cybersecurity. So this is looking at the package of cyber threats to the integrity of elections throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, when we mention uh, cybersecurity and elections, some people's minds go straight to electronic voting. Um, electronic voting is actually very, very rare, um, especially in the Commonwealth. Um, but cybersecurity can, of course, threaten elections through many other, uh, many other ways. It can attack um, voter rolls. It, you can have um, data breaches on data held by political parties. Um, it can also involve the um, malicious spread of misinformation. Um, and I think the whole world is finding that to be a more and more topical issue. Okay. So we are developing with many um, country partners a guide to cybersecurity and elections, and we are also conducting a series of workshops based on this guide in various uh, Commonwealth regions. So uh, again, thank you very much for having me. That's the, um, what we're doing with, um, to implement the Commonwealth Cyber Declaration. Thank you, very um, thank you very much, Matthew. And um, some key um, excellent work that you're doing at the moment. And of course, we can uh, collaborate um, with also um, um, ISOC, WEF, and all the others uh, on the panel here today. We don't have uh, much time left. So can I ask uh, for three questions um, from the floor, please? Or it doesn't have to be a question or a comment uh, cons uh, to any of our panels. And when questions are asked, the floor can also help um, address the questions. Lenny? Oh, it's okay. Please introduce yourself and uh, the organization. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Nicole Darabian. I'm from Ofcom, uh, the communi communications regulator in the UK. Thank you so much for such a rich panel. I think there's a lot of information to digest, but very interesting areas of work. I was wondering, maybe from the civil society perspective, um, if um, there's been any sort of work done to, um, let's just say, incentivize maybe more governments to sign the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime? Um, or what are kind of steps or maybe challenges that you see on that? Because I feel like we're talking a lot about cybercrime and as far as I know, that convention is the only legally binding uh, treaty that exists in this area. So just wanted to find out that perspective. Um, and then maybe if I can extend my privilege here, um, I for ISOC as well, really interested in your work. Um, I was wondering if uh, part of the recommendations or the programs that you have with ISPs or um, infrastructure uh, companies, if you're conducting any sort of uh, vulnerability testing, if there's any sort of vulnerability assessment. I'm saying this mostly because in our organization we have developed a vulnerability test that we have seen gain some traction in other countries that would like to develop it. So just wondering if that's an area you're already involved in. Thank you. Is there another question? I'd rather uh, we ask. Uh, let's make it two because we have two minutes left. Is there another question or another comment from the floor? Um, at the back there, please. Hi there. Um, my name is Eno. I'm from the National Cyber Security Center in Ghana. And um, you mentioned something that the Commonwealth is um, looking at setting some guide for um, elections and cyber security. And I was wondering when these guidelines will be ready because um, Ghana's election year is um, next year, 2020. We have elections in that year. And I'm wondering when these guidelines will be ready and see if it will be ready just in time for our elections. Thank you. 
Nisa, there's a comment from Vanuatu said. Oh, okay. Um, Vanuatu, please. I can't let you let, let go past Vanuatu. <laughs> Thank, thank you very much. My name is uh, Jeffrey Garay. I serve as the uh, cybersecurity uh, advisor to the government of Vanuatu. Um, my, uh, it's more not only a comment, but it's more a question around, uh, there's a lot of discussions around multi-stake approach. And I'm wondering if, uh, because of the REITs panel, if there's any assessment done on the process or how effective those uh, various um, multi-stake approach within the different regions. And I'm quite uh, pleased to hear the, the Latinic um, technical approach. It sounds that um, strategies or policies have been driving the good work or fast um, approach to addressing um, malicious activities around that area. So does that mean that uh, across the region, uh, legislations or strategies are similar across to, to facilitate fast uh, uh, mechanisms in place? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackson. So let's go to the um, uh, first question and quickly, please, Julia, and then followed by um, Olaf. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, well, uh, our organization, like civil society organization, we don't focus uh, on the promotion of the Budapest Convention. Uh, uh, now, I can give you as a you know expert answer on this because I've, I've been working a lot with the Cybercrime Convention, Budapest Convention, in different countries all over the world. And I think what's happening when the country is interested in um, in accessing the Budapest Convention, of course the uh, the whole multi-stakeholder community is pushing for this and also working for this. Now, what is true, it depends on the country, and maybe it's one of the recommendations to take from here to the Council of Europe to involve and to work more closely with the civil society in the countries who express the view and the interest in accessing the good of this convention. So, this will be done. Um, very shortly, I was not aware of an Ofcom vulnerability scanning tools, but um, uh, so this is a good piece of information, I, and I think this is generally the case. There are multiple initiatives across the world that improve our, our security, and it, I think it's a feature that sometimes something happens over there that you're not aware uh, of over there, but that these type of forums where we come together and share information make us aware this could feed into the work that is done in LACNIC, this could feed into the work that we're doing in Africa and across actually the whole uh, uh, ecosystem to create a, a better security uh, system. So I'm absolutely interested in your, your tool set. Thank you. Um, yes, please. Guy's um, question. Thank you. Um, I'll just address this to my our colleague from Ghana. I'm uh, delighted to be able to say that we've actually uh, worked very closely with Ghana on our election cybersecurity work. We found them a very, um, very um, helpful partner indeed. Uh, we've just uh, spent uh, a month in Ghana work with the Ghana Electoral Monitoring Board, and they've um, been one of the key inputs into the guide, actually. So uh, we are going to be working closely with Ghana in the lead up to that election. Thank you. Uh, and uh, um, yes, Kevin, to answer the uh, Vanuatu question. Thank you. Yes, thanks for the comments from the colleague from Vanuatu. Um, just to, and thanks again for recognizing the good work that uh, we are doing. Um, similar to all of the RIRs, we are all working on coordinating our messages um, when it comes to public education and a couple of us, we are involved in face-to-face -face, um, technical training um, to help CISO capacity. And um, with that being said, um, unfortunately, um, LACNIC, like the other RIRs, we are really bound by the mandate of our members. So getting involved in policy making and legislation is not something that we will necessarily do because it's not um, within our competence to do so. There are many others um, that can, but one of the things that we do try to do is that when we do have an intervention at a country level that we do line up with um, other actors uh, providing um, different training needs. So if there are actors that are looking specifically at a policies level, we'll try to make sure that there is some level of cohesion and we work with local communities to understand better the entire landscape to really build effective um, strategy. Okay, so is there anybody else that wants to raise uh, any issue at all? 
No? What we have done today is very important. Uh, we are going to have a look at all the information that was shared today and look at how the CTO and also the uh, Commonwealth can work together or separately, depending on the angle of the assistance. But I want to say that what's very important is for you to write for the Commonwealth countries, let us know what your priority needs are. Because what has come out very clear in this panel is that with the challenge of, of cybersecurity come new skills. As you have heard, everybody needs to learn how to tackle this from judges, from the uh, law enforcement, from citizens on how to understand, uh, you know, in understanding how to deal with it if they are involved personally. So with that, I would like to thank uh, my uh, distinguished uh, panelists for to this afternoon, this session. It's been um, an excellent session, very um, informational, and uh, it will help the Commonwealth countries. And I thank the Honorable Minister, for, um, Deputy Minister from South Africa for your presence. And uh, so right now, please, let's come to the center here and uh, take a photograph, this, um, please. Thank you again, everybody. Sure, no problem, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I have to run too to another session.
you. Thank you so much, my dear. Thank you. I hope it was. Oh, it was awesome. Oh, yes, it was. It was great. Okay.